Welcome to Network Security, the basic part number three. Here we'll be talking about botnet architectures and I will go through a number of uh, simple but, uh, but good models. Uh, so of course the simple models we have is a centralized architecture. Uh, so what you can think about when looking at, at the figure is what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of this kind of architecture. Um, we also note here that when the CNC server here is shown as being something controlled by the botmaster but often it will be located in a hacked machine, so the owner is not aware what his machine is actually being used for. But this model is very simple, it's not so useful in real life. Uh, first of all, it's not very reliable, since if one of the bots is being taken down or identified, then it's not too difficult to find the command control server and take that down. So we have a single point of failure, and in addition to having a single point of failure, we might also have a situation where it's too easy to identify the botmaster. So it, it's a nice, uh, simple uh, model to play with in the basement, but it doesn't really work in real life. In the peer-to-peer -peer architecture, we try to deal with some of the shortcomings of the centralized architecture that we saw just before. Uh, so here you have a lot of machines who are connected to each other, like uh, connections here and there. Um, it's, it can look pretty unorganized when you look at it. Um, and the idea is that the botmaster can inject commands to one machine, who will then forward this to other machines, who will forward it to other machines again. And as, a, as an infected zombie, you don't know if your command is coming from the botmaster itself or just from another infected machine. So of course, it's, more, it's here more difficult to trace the CNC server, and it's a lot more difficult to shut it down, because even if you find a machine, you take it out, the rest will still be, be well connected. On the other hand, um, one of the drawbacks is that it doesn't scale very well. So if you have a very large uh, network, it takes quite some time, or it might take quite some time for information to get from one machine to another machine and finally to the whole botnet. So if it's a really large botnet, um, it's very hard to control it and have people doing things at the same time and to make sure all this, the malware is updated and so on. Um, another model is with changing servers, so that really increases the robustness of the botnet since um, you might have one server in one minute, the minute after you switch to another server, the minute after to another server and so on. So you're always changing the servers that you're communicating with. This is a more uh, difficult architecture to implement because you always need to, to contact new servers, uh, but it makes it a lot harder to shut down the, ser the, the servers and the network. And of course you can combine this with having more than one server. So you have multiple servers running, placed in multiple countries at the same time, making it very hard to, to shut it down. Because if one server is down, you can just contact another one, which is in another uh, country or, or region. So I've been going through some simple architectures here. Um, what is important to notice is that often you're using other techniques I will cover fast flocks in the next video to make it even more stealth. Um, also that in fact, different architectures are often combined. So we have some kind of hybrid architectures. Often we also see proxy machines and hierarchy is being used. So not all the zombies are equal, but you can have the zombies in the, in the lowest part who are doing the, uh, all the malicious activities. Then you have a different layer, which is really just working with forwarding information to and from these zombies to another layer, to another layer, and you have the, the botmaster on top of it all. But the distance from the machine carrying out malicious activity to the botmaster is really long and can go through different countries and can be really hard to trace it back to the, to the botmaster. One example uh, that was described by McAfee was an, an attack called 10 Days of Rain, where they installed a botnet specifically for this purpose. And afterwards, they realized where, these, where the servers were located, and they could see that basically the, um, the servers were located uh, all over the world. There were 39 servers in total distributed uh, between USA, Taiwan, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and a lot of other countries. So in total, these machines were spread out over 14 countries. It's also important to notice that different kind of protocols are used to hide the activities. So standard protocols, including IRC, HTTP, so that we use it for web traffic. And also, uh, recently, we're seeing an increase in using instant messenger and other peer-to-peer -peer protocols. 
um, the reason that HTTP is becoming uh, quite popular, while it's quite hard to deploy it, you have so much HTTP traffic that that when you look through a network and you see HTTP traffic, you don't uh, see any alarm bells ringing. Whereas if you would see IRC uh, protocol being used, that might indicate uh, this looks weird or some of the other protocols might also not be very widely used and therefore you get suspicious when you see it. Uh, what you also see is that encryption or, or packets looking differently from packet to packet so you don't have a common pattern to look for is also used in order to, to avoid being, being found and recognized. So for now, please take quiz number nine and then see you very soon.